Viruses are a fairly insidious disease. Being genetic packets of information, while our bodies are able to typically handle an infection by one, the cascade of consequences concerning certain families of viruses, well, it's pretty horrific. <laughs> Whether it is a complete breakdown of your immune system concerning something like an untreated HIV infection that becomes AIDS, or something as simple as a cold concerning the rhinovirus that is just over in a few days, the pathophysiology of an infection is quite varied and ranges from the unconcerning to the downright deadly. But what I've always found the most interesting about viruses, which when I return back to the lab from whence I came one day, I'll be specifically focused on viruses this time around, is their ability to hide within our bodies. Entering cells and essentially stopping a critical component known as an interferon response this is essentially how your cell will yell for help and let the immune system know that it has been infected by something. So not all viruses are capable of this, but some do it a little too well and interrupt this response. In fact, if you would like some existential dread, the uh, current virus that we all know that just emerged and we finally left our caves because of had a particular strain in South America that it was found it blocked interferon production by 99%. Essentially, the man was fully saturated with the virus and his body had no idea he was even infected until symptoms presented because the viral load was so high, but the immune system was then overwhelmed and as a result, he met his end. But that's the thing with viruses. It's actually a very delicate balance. Overwhelm the host too quickly and the virus cannot spread, make too much noise and the immune system will destroy you. Because of this, it takes a virus a bit of time to adapt to the host and become less destructive, thus allowing it to survive and continue to spread. As with all life, and depending on who you ask, viruses really may not even be alive, viruses have the distinct desire, it would seem, to not really destroy you, but just to spread. By natural interaction, however, destruction follows in its wake. That is exactly why we see in George Romero's Diary of the Dead film, which, oh my god, put a helmet on, a mystery virus outbreaks, and as it hits the planet, everyone everywhere all over the world appears to have already been infected without the knowledge of anyone, which indicates some rather interesting quirks, shall we say, about this particular strain of virus. But how exactly did the virus spread, what sort of interactions with the immune system is there, if any, and why after being bitten do they get back up, but also after succumbing to natural causes do they get back up? Well, let's discuss the virology of this disease and see why things are happening the way they are. We kick off our story with this being Lionsgate, which means I am totally boned. Thanks for watching. As the moon rises and sirens wail in the distance, we are at 628 Tremont. Is it important to tell you the address? No. Three people have gotten totally got. The dude took out his wife and his offspring and then took out himself afterwards. Channel 10 then runs over to the ambulance saying, uh, you're blocking our shot, man. Yes, that's how it works. A paramedic totally wouldn't tell them to pound sand. Spoiler. Absolutely, paramedics would tell them to pound sand. The media is in no way important in an unfolding situation like that. So the narrator, Deborah, or Edgelord McGee, says that they downloaded the video off the net. Nobody says net, my lord. Anyways, Brie Reno is reporting on the family who had just gotten taken out. As the cameraman records, the woman begins moving in the background. The cameraman then zooms in on the paramedic as he starts getting bit. The woman then gets up as her son moves and they begin attacking the group. The cops open up on them, but body shots are useless on this thing. Brie Reno then gets bitten and then goes into shock as more sirens wail. For a second time, they say they have downloaded footage off the- Nobody says they download footage off the net. Nobody calls the internet the net, I swear to god. Look, man, I'm a boomer myself, but this is such boomer language. Anyways, we get the standard footage of chaos, riots, and people upset, a real American horror story intro, arrests, and everyone believing it is in fact a hoax. So we then have this artsy fartsy group, which are a bunch of film students, who are the ones who put together this found footage. It's from the perspective of, I guess, Jason, because, and I quote, they wanted the truth exposed. I mean, imagine the infected running around through the streets. That, that might be enough truth for everyone to see. I don't know. Like, I get it. The gooberment lies, but you aren't really going to cover something like this up. It's just sort of hilarious. The whole premise is, to be honest with you, it's a little dumb. Now, I know some people consider all of George Romero's films to be like, the height of amazing. This one? Total turd in the punch bowl. But you're not here to listen to me wax poetically about films. We are here for the disease. It's October 24th at 11pm. A woman in white comes running through the woods as a literal mummy chases her. Then they call cut. So now we hear this woman with the deepest southern accent, this side of the Mississippi, although technically it's the other side of the Mississippi, to me, because she's from Texas. Clearly, it's not going well in terms of what they're trying to accomplish here. So the professor is just kind of casually drinking in the background as he's forced to be out there with the students for some reason. He says he'll give them each five college credits if they actually finish this movie. 
Jason is making a horror film, and according to the narrator, it's the night everything changed. They keep hearing sirens in the background as one guy comes over to tell them, oh, something's on the news. Seemingly, those who were gone are now coming back to life. The first was a 50-year-old man in a drive-by who sat up on the autopsy table and then attacked the forensic pathologist. Five more were taken out in the process, and even more were taken out after that as Mr. Skeptical over here, also known as Tony, says that, well, obviously the six separate reports, they're all mistakes. Yes, that tracks. They then hear a distant howl as dogs begin yelping. At this point, they decide to abandon the shoot as the mummy douches out, but invites everyone over to come with him. Nobody except for one woman goes with him as Jason says he's going to go to the dorms as Deb is there and he doesn't want her to be alone. Who is Deb? We'll find out. Entering the dorm, the woman's dorm specifically, it's an absolute mess only 25 minutes after the news drops about the dead coming back to life. Walking through, someone is in a room moving around. As Jason checks, Leather Jacket comes out here because he's stealing stuff. He calls for security saying, why do you have a camera in the women's dorm? Aren't you the weirdo? As like, this is like haunted trail sort of nonsense. That's all I'm saying. So then he just kind of runs off into the dark. Okay then, enjoy the mini furge, I suppose. Heading to Deb's room, he knocks on the door as she comes out with a trophy and almost takes him out, which I, I really wish she had of. Also, why is she the only one left in her dorm? Luckily, Jason is here, so all your problems are over. Either that or they're about to get way worse because Jason here is about as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Looking at the computer, it's footage from the literal beginning of this movie. Deb then calls her parents, but they don't answer either, so that's probably a good sign. Deb then starts narrating about random nonsense nobody knows, and I'm sparing you the amount of edge in these narrations. The group somehow decides to regroup, even though none of their phones clearly work like they they don't like nobody can get a phone call out so how do they know to regroup they just happen to have a winnebago between them i guess so they're each gonna go to their individual homes to check on their families jason starts interviewing everyone in case this is a real thing and literally nobody wants to answer him which is kind of hilarious see the problem here is everyone's from the northeast this is just your standard interaction up there even without zombies so Mary starts telling the camera about what's happening, and the Department of Homeland Security raised threat level to orange, but they expect everything will turn back to normal. And they base this on absolutely nothing. Unbased, some would say. They continue saying the CDC is indicating that this is a viral strain that leads to psychosis. Yes, bodies getting off the autopsy table makes sense. It's simply psychosis. A viral strain, of course. Now, where did I put that epidemiology degree? Now, it's important to remember that certain viruses can have far-reaching implications depending on when they are contracted. Some viruses have actually been shown that if you contract them as like a neonate, a youngling, or a pre-adult, currently being flooded with hormones, you know basically what age that is, to become an adult, this can actually cause schizophrenia later in life. I also have to call them those names if you're new here, otherwise YouTube will nuke monetization from orbit and disable my comments. It has happened several times in this channel. Everybody's like, oh, well, I hear others say it. Yes. I wish I could say it too. I have no idea why I get targeted, but it just is what it is. You gotta roll with the punches. So the reasoning here is due to like the schizophrenia presenting and it's obviously a symptom of this, which what is a symptom of schizophrenia? Everyone's favorite mental disorder, psychosis. However, with this virus, this is affecting adults in the same way. So it may be easy to like point at psychosis, which clearly would be caused by an inflammatory mechanism kicking in, which then inflames the meninges. But really, I believe there is more to do with like cerebral degeneration due to the presence of the virus itself, or at least the functionality is significantly decreased. But we will get there when we start discussing the neurology and metabolism behind this virus. So as they continue driving, old man in the back is just straight up glued to that bottle. But as they look behind the Winnebago, a car drives by laying on the horn. The professor then gives his intro, but the dude is just plastered. And looking in front of the Winnebago, they see some cars overturn. And I guess that's the guy that just passed them. But as a cop emerges from the fiery wreckage, he's looking a little well done. They freak out as they can't get around the wreck. Like, yes, you can. It's literally on like maybe just barely over the line. There's so much space to drive around it. So the cop approaches the window as Mary then drives through very easily past the passable wreck. And looking further down, Mary just starts wrecking face on these guys, running them all down. Also, these are the worst headlights I've ever seen in my life. So it being 3 a.m., they decide to pull over for the night. Jason asks Mary how she feels about what just happened. I mean, my man, maybe now isn't the time to kind of just start asking those questions. And Mary has a breakdown over taking them out as she goes and sits alone in the field. And I mean, they were infected. And if they weren't, they could have easily gotten out of the middle of the road. In fact, we will see some infected who do open doors or at least hold them open and then literally step out of the way of the Winnebago here in a little bit. 
So actually, those you ran over, basically it was infected behavior. Also again, Tony sucks, just saying. It's now October 25th, 4.13 a.m. They keep talking about what they need to do as the professor says he's running low on bourbon, which is the real tragedy. They then hear a shot as Mary just straight up domes herself. So Southern Belle then runs over like, oh my God, we're turning this into something that it's not supposed to be. Or something like that. I don't know. It was pretty heavy, even like for me living in Alabama. But Tony starts saying, it's nonsense. So as they check Mary, she's still alive and she actually still has a pulse, which is pretty surprising. Taking her to a hospital during a zombie outbreak, this is literally a bad idea. There's nobody there. You are at the epicenter of the issue now. Good planning. They hear nothing but flatline monitors and phones ringing. Hearing a radio, they then run around the corner because they think it's somebody, but there's no one. So as they listen to the radio though, the cops are seemingly not doing so hot. They start yelling about aiming for the head, but for some reason, this group is just not grasping the reality of the situation. And it's honestly like, it's something to behold. Like, cope of the century, they're like, oh, well, maybe all the, <laughs> maybe all the doctors and nurses are on break and all the patients are just sleeping and the cops are talking about I don't know, getting hit. No, they're not talking about that. But it's just like, what? It's a zombie invasion. Like, come on, let's, let's, let's get with it here. But at this point, Jason's camera dies momentarily as they're able to get back up and running. And entering a room, one of the residents is infected. Gordo then takes aim as he's only doing body shots, but nothing until really he hits him in the head. As you guys, like, know, these, these guys are really moving slow. This seems like a fairly easily solvable situation. Uh, the nurse is also infected over there, snacking on a manwich. As Deborah ends up shocking the nurse with a defib to the skull, Mary is now awake and in probably a lot of pain, and oh, they then dome the nurse to just take her out. Jason says he needs to charge his camera now, which then tethers him to the wall because he can't put down the camera and survive. You're gonna be annoyed by Jason, trust me. Continuing to search the hospital to get help for Mary, Jason then talks about how his camera is plugged in, so he can't go anywhere, and he laments, and then he apologizes to Mary because the people Mary took out were very clearly infected. Walking over to Mary, she then wakes up as Jason hears screaming and shots fired. Bro, put down the camera. Hearing, like, walking, I guess, Deb comes over, and she found another camera, which is just what you want to do. Really, you want to enable this guy with cameras. So she records Jason and then starts talking mad smack about, Is this helpful, Jason? Do you want to see what happened? It's really strange. She picks a weird time to bring up what just happened. So Deb is covered in blood. Jason then asks if she got hurt, but nope, she's all good. Bro, the acting is just, it's something else. Like, if you haven't seen this movie, maybe you should go watch it. So while that monologue is happening, dude then rolls off the table as Gordo then takes him out next. He starts tripping about taking out zombies at this point as the professor walks over and says, killing comes easy eventually. He doesn't sound like that, he's got a different accent, but it's really the only accent I got. The professor then starts also talking mad smack to Jason because he finds him annoying. Same. Everyone hates Jason for good reason. So as Mary's in the chair, eventually she flatlines out and then turns quickly, which the professor then takes the force multiplier from him and takes out Mary. So here we see the first instance that whatever is happening is beyond just being bitten by someone. And this indicates something well beyond just your standard outbreak. And to that end, she's one of the clues as to what's happening. So first and foremost, what are we looking at based on these context clues? Outlining the problem here, the entire human race appears to be infected with no symptoms in their living life. However, once they succumb to anything, any type of disruption to their life process, they will then turn into one of the infected and then get back up and attack others. The other side of the coin is being bitten can also produce the same symptoms and actually induce death in a person, causing them to turn. So this indicates something interesting about this virus. These are actually two different strains of the same virus. It sounds a little weird, but I think we are intimately familiar with how new variants of strains can just pop up. But there is a fairly easy way to kind of compare these two strains to not use just the one that everybody knows, or maybe even use the one everybody knows because uh, it's horrifying. And based on how horrifying it is, is the symptoms that it produces. Herpes! Herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2 both obviously hail from the herpes viridae family. Others include chickenpox, Epstein-Barr virus, amongst like a hundred others. However, specifically with HSV-1 and HSV-2, the differences, despite infecting the same neuronal tissue, is astounding. It has been hypothesized that HSV-1 has been with humanity for a very long time, and because of this, the virus has evolved with the human immune system for quite some time and is less aggressive concerning outbreaks and issues. HSV-1 is, of course, the cold sore virus, and it's fairly common to see that, like, it's hypothesized about 50 to 80% of Americans have HSV-1. Now, here's the thing about this, and I didn't realize a lot of people didn't understand this. Everybody always thought, like, oh, you only get HSV-1 on your mouth. Oh, no. 
You can get HSV1 upstairs and downstairs. It does not matter. You can get HSV2 upstairs and downstairs. It does not matter. It just depends on what tissue came into contact with what. But now we got to talk about the ball buster known as HSV2. HSV2 did not evolve with humans. This one made a species jump from apes to humans, and it's about as bad as you think that it got here because of that. The difference is the ape immune system is actually a lot stronger, and as a result, outbreaks are kept in check more strongly by their immune systems, and it had less impact. They also have different tissues concerning their immune system. It's a whole thing. But once getting to humans, this is why it's considered pretty bad, because outbreaks are more painful and spread more aggressively. This version infects only about 12% of the population. Both these viruses are becoming more common, which is horrific. So if you uh, are out there, like, I mean, I've been shoved out into the dating world again, and uh, you got to be careful. But the point is, these two viruses, who seem rather similar, can have a wider range from being more or less aggressive and triggering worse outbreaks or even worse things like attacking the brain, inducing things like meningitis, rendering you deaf or blind, or it could just be your standard outbreak of painful sores but there are nuances to each virus. HSV-1 can infect you and you'd actually, there's a chance you'd never really know you were infected. No signs of outbreaks, no strong immune response. Maybe you even just have a complete lack of swollen lymph nodes or fever. Instead, you undergo a process known as viral shedding, which is how it spreads. And of course, viral shedding is there's no sores. It's just, your, it's shedding in between your epithelial cells. It's kind of wild, but this will be important later. I know we're really talking about this, but it's important to see how viruses can move through your system and may not trigger a strong immune response. And hopefully my editor is not just putting up tons of pictures of herpes. Really? Oh, so that's how you're gonna play it. You gonna do this? Okay, fine. It became personal with me. But the herpes virus actually targets nerve clusters in your body, which is why you can never really get rid of it, at least for now. CRISPR may offer a cure in the future, but the immune system cannot just attack your nerves. Well, it can, but it doesn't want to. And this is where the virus hides. The trigeminal nerve ganglia is where it established itself and future outbreaks in the head of a person. Specifically, this is going to be the oral region. But the other area is the sensory nerve ganglia adjacent to the spinal cord and lower back. By hiding in these nerves, if it's HSV-1, then you may never see an outbreak or never even know. But if it's HSV-2, highly likely you will know. But the point there is... You can still be infected with HSV-2, even if you have HSV-1 and vice versa, but the symptoms will be completely different, or at least different enough for you to take notice. Okay, so enough about herpes for now. And just like herpes, this conversation is going to come back up. The professor then hands Tony the handheld as we get a monologue about, oh, it's so crazy how we can figure out what we become when we have to become <laughs> edgy. What am I watching? Deb, please shut up. One of the infected also just straight walks past Jason and just grabs Gordo and bites him. Everyone stands there watching as the other guy tries to take him out. And yeah, yeah, nobody help or anything. It's all good. How did Jason not get bit? Like for real, he was in the back. So Southern Bell then runs over to Gordo, who's talking about his exposed tricep hurting. And it do be that way, I imagine. They're now talking about how everyone has a camera and there's a ton of footage online. And just the other day, I got an internet that was sent by my staff at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. And then I just got it on Tuesday. The internet is not something you could just take a dump on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. Anyways, if you got that stupid quote, you now know uh, it's comparable to saying Guam is going to tip over if we put soldiers on the island. Truly, the mega minds of our time are running the government. Anyhow, past that point, it's now October 25th, 7 a.m. The group then buries their succumbed as Gordo has already met his end after getting bit. They realize now, anyone who has met their end can come back as one of these things, meaning they are all already infected. It's really just waiting for the body to stop behaving in a certain way, but what does that mean exactly? Well, I always have somebody complain about they hate this format now, but hey man, it is what it is. Back to the herpes, baby. Actually, not really. We're going to discuss viruses and neuronal infections, not just not just herpes. So now viruses specifically as stated can infect the trigeminal nerve amongst other cranial nerves in the skull. And I believe this is integral to explaining those who meet their end by natural means versus being infected through a bite and succumbing. Gordo contracted a different variant of this virus, but how do these form? It is natural for viruses, as mentioned, to take on completely different characteristics once infecting someone. Again, looking at the wild type variant of a virus that shut down the planet for a while, arguably the symptoms were stronger than they are now, and this is fairly normal. I mean, even look at Spanish flu. It took out 50 million people when it first dropped, and now it just runs through every year, and 
Really, the only people that are susceptible are the immunocompromised, the elderly, and the really, really young. But the virus doesn't want to take you out because it wants to spread. It just can end up doing so in the process. Looking back to my example of interferon response being subdued by 99%, that is a variant of the virus that was just way too aggressive, and as such, it could not spread because it just screwed up too many things too quickly. Seeing as the entire human race appear infected already, as anyone who meets their end turns, the variant spread through biting has a much more aggressive impact. But why is this? Because it hails from the same virus that already is in everyone, it is very likely going to hit the same locations, and it's going to have the same ones that it likes to infect. To this end, I believe the brainstem is the target of this particular virus, with, let's call it, ZSV1 for Zombie Simplex Virus 1, just for fun, that's not its actual name, this less aggressive version implants into the brainstem of a person where it's relatively quiet. The immune system appears to have a handle on it should there be like, you know, a viral trickle out into the bloodstream, but it's able to pretty much overcome it, so it's not really that big of a deal, develops antibodies, not a problem. And this is why the symptoms don't really seem to present in anyone. As the virus continues to exist, it would still change. Eventually, this results by pure chance in a version known as ZSV2. This version spawned out of very unique events, and it would appear as though the man at the beginning and his family developed ZSV2 as they turned on him, infecting him with this new variant. This version has the ability to completely disrupt the brainstem functioning, which in turn bodies the individual. From here, this new version, again, it's much more aggressive and will continue working its way through the brain, but ultimately it results in a person who has a new variant. But the question remains, why is it then when someone has ZSV1, they turn? Well, we'll discuss that in a minute. So Tony then goes to double tap Gordo, but Southern Bell's like, oh no, let's wait and see. He's gonna come back, which of course he does, so she has to take him out. The professor then says, he just flunked out. Wow, cool joke at this time, bro. Like, that bourbon must be hitting. So on the radio, they're talking about how these are the end times, and it seems about right. And it's at this point that everyone is pretty much panicking. Looting, violence, killing, small towns or ghost towns, and people are just attempting to survive, cats and dogs laying together, pure chaos. Using country roads, they were able to avoid all that crap, which is why you'll never catch me in a city. Yeehaw, baby. The Winnebago also died, but Southern Bell thinks it's just a fuel line. Based on what exactly, I am not sure. So the Amish then approach them and they start asking uh, who they are. As he writes down that he can't hear, Tony says they need to use his barn as the Amish guy then points to the infected behind them as he throws some dynamite at them. His name is Samuel. So fixing a line tear, I have to ask how that teared exactly, or teared, toward, toward. How, how did that tear? There we go. Yeah, English hard. So as they watch a birthday party on a camera for some reason, I'm sure everything isn't about to go to crap. The clown approaches a little unsteadily. Of course, he's a clown, so, you know, he might just be drunk. The dad then pulls off his nose and he gets immediately bitten. Also, that wasn't a crack at all clowns. I'm sure it's a, a very proud tradition. I, clowns creep me out. They then hear a noise as predictably the infected are here. Well, who could have seen this coming, considering they were already there to begin with? Truly shocking. So the infected are everywhere trying to break into the barn, and I wonder if the dynamite alerted the horde. Samuel then says that they need to go to the back door of the barn, leaving Southern Belle to work on the car, with absolutely nobody staying there to help her. Heading into the basement, Samuel gets the door closed, but they can hear something is down there with them. They don't know how many of the infected are in there, as then they start popping up. Tony then takes one as he turns to another and then takes out that one. So Southern Bell starts getting attacked, but Samuel was able to stab it with a scythe and pull it back before it got her. They then get the barn door open as they run to the Winnebago. In the background, you can see one of the zombies is actually holding the door open. It's hilarious. Samuel then takes out the infected and then himself with the scythe, or I guess really himself first and then the infected. Not really sure. I don't think you could. I'm not really sure you could do that. You wouldn't have the strength because as soon as your brain gets pierced, I feel like that's going to like jolt your hands outwards, sort of like um, the corticate posturing. But as they drive, the zombies then step out of the way <laughs> very nicely, allowing the Winnebago to pass. Bro, what am I watching? Deb then says, there's not enough bullets to stop the infected in like the edgiest way possible. And it's like, no, Mrs. Doom and Gloom. What's funny is it's not even remotely true. There are 12 billion bullets in this world and only 8.1 billion humans. You could still retain 25% of the world's stock. Did I just do that math wrong? Yeah, I did. 33% of the world's stock. That was organic. Anyways, there is more than enough to deal with this issue at hand. So as they keep talking, a random dude emerges and then smacks one of the guys. And then he starts saying, Oh, Tony, your handheld isn't as good as his. So what? 
one shot is all it takes. Like, are y'all for real? Like, just because some. Okay, if you're if you're if you've got just a, a nice little handheld and they've got a rifle, right? You're pointing at each other point blank. All I'm saying is both are gonna work equally well. But anyways, the men are being pursued as pot shots start hitting all around them. So they say the Winnebago is coming with them. So following the truck, that's a pretty stupid idea because all I can think about are the cannibals from The Last of Us. So entering a storage facility of some kind, it's clearly an armed militia, I guess, of sorts. They then tell them that they are trying to get to Scranton. The men were like in the National Guard and seemingly the government has just abandoned several areas, this area being one of them. So Jason heads further back into the storage area for more footage from the beginning of the movie, keeps playing. The media apparently is lying to everyone. I'm shocked. Shocked! Eh, not that shocked. So, Deborah comes in and is angry at Jason for editing the footage. Why didn't you just stay in the Winnebago and edit, like, edit it? Like, wouldn't that have made more sense? Why did you go to a creepy part of a warehouse? But then he says, look, I uploaded this eight minutes ago, and I've got 72,000 views on it. That is the dream, baby. Share this video with your friends. So, Deb is angry at Jason for uploading the video, and it's like, I get it, bro. Uploading the video above all else. Like, that's the name of the game. Like, for six years now. The sick uh, prior events vacation has not mattered. I have not stopped. So Deb then gets a text message from her brother like they were camping. So now they are headed home. So Deb is like super jazzed that they're still alive. I mean, that was days ago that she got the text. Like it finally sent. They might not be alive. But then Jason gets a call on his computer. The mummy and the girl from earlier are at the mummy's house drinking champagne. So back in uh, the wonderful facility, one of the men had a bad heart and then ended up succumbing. So like, that's probably not good, but then they ended up losing them. Like, I don't know how they lost him. So as Jason walks out, he enters a red light room as Tony heads back there to grab Jason. Jason is kind of wandering around some bad juju areas, and then finding an exit sign, he starts hearing something, as then he jump scares himself. Turning around, Tony has found him as they start to exit the area. The professor at this point goes into the Winnebago to clear it of the infected, and then finding nothing, the other girl gets in as they keep searching for the guy. Yeah, that's like you get in and then you shut the door. That's the best way to do that. So now Tony and Jason are both lost. Somehow. Like, didn't you both just walk back there? How did you get lost? They then find the other door that allegedly, like, leads out as they scare the men who are looking for the guy with the bad heart. Finding the guy, they then open up on him, taking him out. Allegedly. Except it wasn't him. It was just a random guy that they liked. Hmm. Wrong place, wrong time. So Tony gets grabbed as they can't really take a shot at him because he's near the gas. Tony then breaks a jar of hydrochloric acid on him as it slowly eats through his brain and then finally takes out the zombie. Okay, so here we have a perfect example of the symptoms of ZSV-1 and why I believe this is in the brainstem specifically. After a person drops, obviously everything shuts down. The blood stops, the immune system can no longer patrol and keep things in check, and the cells rapidly begin losing oxygen, and eventually they should succumb as their metabolism stops. But herein lies the linchpin to the entire infection. Because ZSV-1 has infected the body, while it may prefer neuronal tissue, which is highlighted by ZSV-2's propensity to stop the heart and damage the brain, it is likely still infecting other tissues, much like the herpes virus does, but using the nervous system as a more permanent infection point. The reality is, the herpes virus wants to infect all of your tissue, but it's destroyed. It just cannot be destroyed in the nerves, and this is why herpes sticks around, otherwise your body would have no problem stomping it into the dirt. Essentially, your immune system has to pull its punches when dealing with nervous tissue. Once the immunological function has been disrupted, at least for a few minutes, cells that have been infected by ZSV-1 would appear to be influenced concerning their metabolism of the actual cell itself. As we all know, our bodies require oxygen to form ATP. However, our cells can undergo a process of anaerobic respiration to create less ATP, like considerably less ATP, but it still creates ATP nonetheless. In doing so, it may be possible that cells, while massively inefficient, are able to survive while the normal human cells succumb. And to this end, we can see potentially this is why intelligence completely flatlines out and they become purely instinctual. The cerebrum of the brain, and where higher thought is associated, specifically also in the frontal lobe, requires much more energy than aerobic respiration could provide. In fact, the brain itself, all incoming oxygen and nutrients, 20% goes to, what is it, like three and a half pounds in your skull. The other 80% goes to the rest of your body. So other cells do not need near as much energy. So as a result, the neurons would not be firing as much or as well as they could. This decrease in intelligence also shows why headshots still work, but body shots do not. The brain is still an integral point of functioning to the body. And without it, 
true death is achieved. However, once a person drops by normal means, the virus appears to have influenced the anaerobic cycle in a way that may have made it more viable than our standard cycle, but not as efficient as aerobic respiration. Baser instincts are still active, but you can almost compare it to sort of like a small gas tank of like two or three gallons running a larger engine that is also more inefficient once infected. The bodies would need to almost constantly eat and take in nutrition, driving them to attack others as they are no longer getting the same mileage out of their caloric intake. It's sort of like, let's say you have a three gallon gas tank, right? And like, okay, I need to get across this desert. Well, I can either take the V8 350 uh, and just hammer down and I'm gonna go fast, it's gonna be great, but you're gonna run out of gas in like 10 miles. Or you could take the, the piece of crap uh, 1.5 turbo that's currently in my Honda Accord that's gonna blow the head gasket out in 100,000 miles. Either way, I'm just saying, like, you're gonna, you're gonna go with the more efficient smaller engine. It's just, it's pulling from the same amount of gas tank, which is not a lot. I hope that landed correctly. Doesn't matter. But it's hard to say if the entire body is infected, but as we can see with their eyes being sunken in, their movement shaky and disjointed, and the paleness of their skin, it's highly likely the heart has not restarted, and we are seeing a metabolic shift internal to each individual cell. This would imply that the virus has actually changed the functioning of the cell, and we do know that the mitochondria functioning can actually be altered in some ways, with physical activity being the main one, but this does show that it can be changed. The virus appears to potentially affect the mitochondria and how it approaches energy production without the presence of oxygen. Highly important, as the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. ZSV2 does not require the same list of circumstances and instead, once infected by this variant, it is much more aggressive, attacking the brainstem of the person, the heart would then be stopped regardless, which in turn triggers the reaction to ZSV1, because at this point, it's just the new variant arose and ZSV2 would then spread faster and more aggressively. And this is why if you, for instance, were not infected with ZSV1, or at least hypothesized to be infected, ZSV2 would probably just flatline you and not do anything. So, as they gas up, they're basically told, that's it. That's enough to get to Scranton. Debden says, well, we're not going to leave without supplies. You're going to have to shoot us, and you're not going to shoot us. Like, good thing this was day one of the outbreak, because day 30 and a bullet would most definitely be coming your way, considering that's a survival situation. So anyways, they load up the Winnebago as a National Guard man approaches Deb and says, you're a lot like me. What does that mean? Who knows? So as they watch YouTube, hopefully Rono Gaming, it appears Tokyo is having the same issues the rest of the planet is, so it is a global disease. For the virus to spread as effectively as it has, this rules out water, physical touch, saliva, or blood. This would need to be an airborne disease, which would actually put it in line with, I believe, measles. It is said that if 10 people are standing around someone who has measles, 9 of them will contract it. It is then spread through the air as a person coughs or sneezes, so I guess a little bit of saliva. So it is dependent upon bodily fluids at this point, and then it goes airborne. This is ZSV1, and it would be an airborne disease similar that initially inspires no symptoms, but over time, a variant known as ZSV2, at least in headcanon, emerges that is more aggressive. But... In being more aggressive, it has altered and changed to a large degree as its vector becomes saliva from a bite. Again, we get more edgy exposition. Seriously, it, again, if you haven't seen it, it's something to behold. And let me see if I can replicate, um, let me, let me do it. More footage. The mainstream vanished with all its power and money. Like, Deborah is like a pizza cutter. She's all edge and no point. Maybe I'm just being cynical on this channel. No way! So, arriving in the most peaceful place in the world, Scranton, they then roll up to Deb's house. Her family, however, is not there. She's just gonna sit there and wait and then tells the rest of the group, hey, you guys have family, you should probably go home. Tony then gets out of the Winnebago and asks Deb if he can just sort of, like, hang out. Jason, I think you're kind of losing your girlfriend there, buddy. You might want to address this. So, then the rest of the squad says, ah, screw it, we're getting off the Winnebago and heading inside. Tripping the alarm, they then head towards the garage to get that annoying noise turned off, and entering the garage, they find evidence the family is in fact home. Everyone is being really stupid about the infected. They already know all this crap happening, and they're like, oh, well, maybe your parents were evacuated. Probably not. They're infected. Looking at the car, there's evidence of attack. Oh, well, maybe your mom just wanted to bang her head against the window and had a nosebleed. So Deb works out, again, it's her mom's blood on the window, and she's like, well, maybe Billy's okay. So Tony tries to calm her down while Jason sits there being about as useful as a glass hammer. And there's like this whole weird interaction where he's like getting real and like, what's your doll's name? Is it a man or a woman? A very strange. Look, I'm just here for the science. This, it was just painful to watch. 
So Deb gets jumped by her little brother after she runs inside. And this is the most athleticism we have seen with these things. Uh, as the professor then just arrows the youngling through the head as Deb runs off. Have you ever seen Scary Movie 1, I believe it was? Where, I forget what the actor's name is, and she's like, I'm not a crazy person. And then she runs off with her arms waving. That is literally how Deb runs off in her house. So Deb's mom is now up in action after finishing her man, which with labored breathing as the professor then puts her down as well. Remember, always reclaim your arrow. And also, I don't believe she was breathing. I think just by her movement, it's putting a little bit of air past the vocal cords, but nothing substantial. So Deb keeps narrating, talking about, we've become a part of it. My God, please make it stop. Blessedly though, the narration does come to an end. It's like Terminator 2 narration, but saying absolutely nothing the whole time. At least Terminator 2 was like, humans kind of suck because we built these nukes. This one's just like, oh, I had to kill a zombie. I'm worse than the zombie. It's like, shut up. So anyways, they get back in the Winnebago headed for who knows where, as it's a quiet ride because Deb is a little depressed. The professor then talks about his home of Portsmouth, but it really wasn't a home, apparently, and everyone has just a certain amount of edge. Jason then tells the rest of the group that he talked to Ridley for some reason, as the driver says, well, we could make it there before dark, or maybe before dawn, because my boy, it's already dark. So as they drive, they then come up on some army jeeps stopping in front of them. As they approach the Winnebago, hmm... Doesn't look right. Probably the body language. So the guy comes in asking, where'd you get all this stuff from? And they're like, oh, we got it from our friend. He's like, yeah, a lot of people seem to be uh, getting things from their friends. Can we be friends? Not a good sign. So they take aim at Jason at this point and tell him to turn off the camera. So after getting robbed, the guys pull off and leave them behind with only their force multipliers. Dave has the realization that everyone who meets their end will come back. Again, indicating that everyone is already infected. So jumping over to like a hazmat clearing team, you would think that they would have some sort of armoring. Checking the rooms, one gets bitten as then they take out the others because they begin their attack. And all I'm saying is a lot of this would be solved with proper armoring around the neck and arms. The guy who was bitten then takes out the old couple before taking himself out. Jason then remarks how it's us against them. Please, someone eat Jason already so Deb can stop also being edgy. Jesus. Look, man, I thought this was going to be a pretty good movie. And then when I sat down and watched it the entire time, I'm like, the hell was that? Anyways, pull up to Ridley's place. It's a mansion, all right? So see the front door wide open, that's also probably a good sign. And I mean, once you clear it, you got yourself a nice place to hold up. And as they enter, yo, is that Prelude Raindrop Choppin', I think it was called? Cannot remember how exactly this song is supposed to be read, but regardless, absolutely amazing song. It's uh, also in the Believe campaign back when Halo was good. Oh, here comes the hate mail. So as they search the area, Ridley then breaks out of the panic room, scaring the absolute crap out of everyone. Checking the panic room, he was looking at the generators and he's happy to have the squad there. He's got food and drinks and pretty much everything that you could need. He gives them the tour as they're really the only ones out there. He tells them to bring in their stuff as Jason hands Tony the camera. Well, he's like, well, I don't want it. It's like, just hold the camera, dude. It's a freaking camera. It's not some like cursed Ark of the Covenant or something. So looking for food, Ridley might be running a little low on supplies himself, although they got that tray of cookies back there. Tony says Ridley is acting a little strange as Ridley says, well, I'm a little tired and a little bit drunk. Then ask Ridley where Francine is, as he says, well, she's out back with the family. Then he says his old man is gone. Then the rest of the family. Then the cook. So Tony asks if someone ate Francine, as Ridley says, no, they're just all gone and I had to bury them. Heading out back, they then follow the blood trail, and dude, Ridley knows what's up. Like, he's the only one to survive. Might be a little crazy at this point, but that's kind of the guy you want on your survival team. So, heading into the back, he turns on the lights to the pool, and they're just sort of like hanging out underwater. Again, indicating they definitely have an anaerobic metabolism at this point, otherwise they would have drowned. So, Ridley has been bitten, so I guess maybe he won't be on the survival team. So, Ridley is now back up in action as he knocks over a statue, alerting the professor that things are not kosher. Jason doesn't help Southern Belle unload the bags as Ridley comes to get her. So, instead of helping her, right, Jason continues to film the attack like a turbo douche. Also, the uh, fact that Ridley just straight up ignores Jason is otherworldly. Apparently, the way to survive is just have a camera. So as he goes after Southern Belle, she runs off and asks for help, as then her dress gets ripped, and it's like what they were trying to film originally as Ridley keeps chasing. Finally, Jason distracts Ridley because he's like, oh, she's about to actually, like, you know, meet her in, as then she hits him with a stick. Jason really is completely useless. At this point, she leaves Jason behind because what a waste, like, for real. Why didn't you even attempt to help? But back in the house, Deb says that they should just stay in the panic room and have a nice pint and wait for all this to blow over. And it's at this point, the other guy then gets bitten in the bath and infected. 
Deb almost takes out Jason, which uh, she should have done, as the professor tells them that Ridley and the other guy met their end and they need to go to the panic room to survive. Jason says that they can't just lock themselves in a room. You, you literally can. Go in there and lay down for the night. You gotta sleep. But seriously, Jason, if you want to stay outside, go get eaten or something. This dude is starting to like rival Amy at this point from the ruins. Not malicious, just so absorbed in filming that they're like a useful, like a non-useful idiot, I guess is the best way to put it. I'm sure there's some literary reason as why this is happening, but it doesn't matter, let me complain. So Deb says, why do I want to go in there without you, Jason? Why? So anyways, Jason finally faux agrees as the professor then loads up as Jason says he can't while backing out of the room. Okay, man. Well, see ya. He then runs into Ridley as, oh, thank God. He finally gets attacked. Please, God, let it be permanent. Yes. So Jason gets attacked and bitten and then goes for his camera, continuing to be attacked as the professor takes out Ridley. Deb then runs up to Jason and just domes him. It's for the best. Oh, he didn't get bitten? He was just taken out? It's for the best. So Jason then hands Deb the camera as now it's her mantle of responsibility. So again, finally, the first part was a joke. Deb does take Jason out as well. And then, horrifically, there is a post-interview with this dude. I'm sorry, it has to be this way. He captures the truth of how stupid his actions were. So if you set out to do that, bravo. But it's not over yet. I have such horrors to show you. The rest of the group then starts looking for Deb as she's smoking in a dark room. How do they lose her exactly? Who knows? She says, I'm going to finish the movie. As the professor says, the movie is over. It's now October 26th at 6 a.m. They get ready for a fun-filled day ahead. There's more edgy dialogue, and I'm not going to repeat it because I value my sanity. But the professor despises mornings. Deb films the professor as they look at the monitors and see the infected are everywhere. Crawling out of pools, coming out of bathrooms, all that good stuff. So they close the door and then seal themselves in. So the last thing Jason downloaded was two drunks taking pot shots at the infected, right? They're infected. And who knows what these people lost. So Deb is like, are we worth saving? You tell me. Uh, yeah. The human race is worth saving even if two dudes are being total clout. Deb, I'm going to need you to let your frontal lobe develop fully and just log off for a while. And thus concludes Diary of the Dead. What a ride. Clearly this outbreak involves two different variants of the same virus. Really cool idea. Really stupid people. But... All this is going to have similar outcomes. It would appear most, if not all, of the human race is infected with the first variant, but as it adapted to the human body, it became more aggressive rather than coexistent, which can happen by random chance. The issue will arise when everyone from this point is going to have to be double tapped after they drop. Otherwise, they'll get up and start walking around again and biting people. But I want to hear what you guys think. Do you think this virus was two different variants, or do you believe it to be more supernatural? Like that one time I forgot that head was in the cooler in Dawn of the Dead. Let me know down in the comments. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales link, where this week we talked about the Dorothy, Dorothea, excuse me, quarry disaster. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-Grade Horror Movies. Very apropos for what we just covered. Dakota 23, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. And to the rest of my patrons, I appreciate your help as well. Your support goes a long way, so thank you. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.